Hollywood has a serious postmodern problem, and we're seeing the evidence in horrifically annoying people like Rachel Zegler, star of the upcoming Snow White live-action remake, who is now quite infamous for her obvious hatred of the original cartoon. She can't stop talking about how it's old, so it must be bad, because it's old. I just mean that it's no longer 1937. <laughs> and we, you know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937, yeah. and very evidently so. <laughs> the cartoon was made 85 years ago, and therefore it's extremely dated. Everyone on YouTube, including me, is excited for the actor strike to be over so she can open her insufferable mouth some more. She's definitely not a glitch for more views. No exploits here. We'll get to Rachel and her disdain for all things aged, but she isn't the only symptom of Hollywood's postmodern problem. Everywhere in film and television, we are seeing a breakdown of morality, not just behind the scenes anymore, but on screen with the villainless movie or misunderstood sympathetic villain becoming boringly overdone at this point, but the writers in LA still think it's clever. How's it working out for you? What, being clever? Their misunderstanding of postmodernism is the root of their obsession with constant subversion. This surface level knowledge of both modernism and postmodernism is why everyone in Hollywood thinks swaps are so edgy and cool, but they aren't actually saying anything. In fact, since all they talk about are the supposed oppressors, white men, and their commentary means nothing without them, Hollywood is kind of saying that white men are the only thing of importance worth talking about. Bitch, I'm about. I'm about. Bitch, I'm about. I'm about. It's good to be the king. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We should start at the very beginning, which I am reliably informed is a very good place to start. How did we get here? What led Hollywood to this wretched place that is now turning audiences off and losing them hundreds of millions of dollars? To answer that question, we're going to have to go back a bit and talk about where postmodernism started in order to see how these original ideas got so warped. Sometimes postmodernists reject the idea of absolute truth, but it's absolutely true that hitting the like button helps the channel. Seriously, this, this is the move? seen clips of Jordan Peterson, you know he hates postmodernism the way Ron Swanson hates skim milk. There's only one thing I hate more than lying. Skim milk. Which is water that's lying about being milk. It's unfortunate that Peterson doesn't make a distinction between the new basic version of postmodernism that is pervading our entire culture and the roots of the philosophy because those roots are actually quite interesting even if you disagree with them and the study of them is very instructive for anyone who wants to do philosophy. Sadly for most people, certainly for Hollywood, their main takeaway is basic sophistry and lofty statements about the subjectivity of morals. What makes discussing postmodernism so difficult is that it not only lacks a concise definition, but the term can refer to multiple disciplines. And you might agree with something like postmodern architecture while disagreeing with postmodern philosophy or science. One of the things that bothers me about the subject is that since the topic is so wide and kind of vague, most attacks on postmodernism are just deflected as, well, you don't really understand it. I'm starting to think its proponents don't understand it either, but that's a completely different video. For today, I'm going to keep things simple, which is fine for our purposes here because Hollywood has a very simplistic understanding of postmodernism and they took the worst and most basic lessons from it, and that is today's point. Even though it's branched out, all postmodernism shares something. At their core, the movements are all a response, a rebellion even, to modernism. So to understand postmodernism, you also have to understand modernism. I know, I'm going to make it quick so we can get back to Hollywood and how they're mucking all this up. You're such fucking dopes. Modernism is something that also spans multiple disciplines, but they also share a common idea. Some sources will tell you modernism really started during the Enlightenment period in the 18th century. Others will point to it being a more Western idea that gained steam in the late 19th century. You could even say it began with Plato when he spoke of forms, these perfect ideas that all other things come from. Whatever the time period, modernism sought to find the best of things, the pinnacle of each area. They had different paths, but modernists shared the idea that they could discover the very best of a thing, especially if they applied reason. In their own way, modernists were a bit of a rebellion against pre-modernism, which many felt was too stuck in one traditional conservative way of doing things. Here, look, this brilliant thumbnail sums it up perfectly. This thumbnail is art. This is great. I wish I could do this. It's beautiful. I've looked at this for five hours now. 
In art and film, modernism was about trying to get away from realism. It was about the expression of life, not just the objective representation of it. This is why modern art can look, well, bad, in my opinion. Yes, the ideas Pollock and Picasso were expressing were interesting, I suppose, and their rebellion against traditional high art was novel at the time, but I still think their paintings suck to look at. It's kind of like how I can respect the impact that grunge had on the music industry while not ever wanting to hear hear any Nirvana song ever. Bitch, I said what I said. Sometimes you gotta try new things to push boundaries. I get that. Sometimes, however, that results in albums like mm, Saint Anger. Despite things getting very experimental, film and art were attempting to find the best film and art to find the best expression of reality. And that process involved tearing down some old things and creating new crazy things. What's important here is that it was all in search of a high ideal. Hollywood was kind of born out of this idea, and film was an excellent new form of expression that allowed for incredible creativity. Some of that new creativity evolved into animation, like that dusty old garbage, Snow White, which is so dated and horrible and, uh, Rachel, how would you describe it? Weird. Weird. Rather than showing reality as it is, like paintings did, film was interested in expressing ideas, stories. Film also broke new barriers, like temporal continuity. The Great Train Robbery is not the first film to tell a whole narrative, as some claim it is, but it is the first one to cut from one time to another and trust the audience would understand the time passage. Now, that seems pretty obvious now, but in 1903, it blew people's freaking minds. Still, widely considered the greatest American film in history, Citizen Kane not only pushed technical boundaries, but attempted to express an idea about material success and true happiness, and asked the audience to take that idea home and mull it over. You know, if you're a real intellectual, like me, you'll also have seen Citizen Max, the Tiny Toons version. It's excellent, thought-provoking, and loony. If you recognize that tune, uh, you're gonna need some ibuprofen for your lower back. The important thing to remember is that filmmakers were trying to make the best film. That is modernism. Today, films are just media content. Oh, I just started the second season of media content. No spoilers. They express nothing. And partly that stems from the postmodern belief that there is no such thing as a best film. A movie doesn't have to express a grand narrative about life because no such narrative exists. If you're wondering why contemporary cinema doesn't stir you, it's because it isn't even trying to. The writers often don't even think there is a universal reality or ideal that we can all aspire to. Often, the best kinds of things for modernists were the simplest, or at least the simplest thing stripped away the unnecessary so progress could be made. In the art world, you got people like Mondrian trying to reduce things down to the most basic elemental shapes to represent a thing or idea. In architecture, you got simple shapes and efficient materials. As I said, I'm not a fan of these art styles and modernist architecture did birth the projects like Pruitt Igo, Cabrini Green, which are universally considered failures. The point, though, is that modernism was trying to achieve the best in humanity by trying new things and stripping away the superfluous, which is a great idea, but it doesn't and can't always work. And that was one of the points early postmodernists were making. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Modernist philosophy and science worked in much the same way, trying to use reason and logic to cut through all the crap and discover the best, the ultimate truth. We the best against the best. No, we, we, to we, see who's the best. Test, test, test. You know, it's interesting to note that modernism is generally attributed to the West in the late 19th century, which uncoincidentally coincides nicely with the Industrial Revolution when we were discarding tradition in favor of progress. It is also not surprising that the Second World War and Western culture after it ended coincide with the rise of postmodernism. Historical periods and their epistemes have a lot to do with our philosophies and art and everything. So postmodernism was a critique of modernism, and at first it was cool. Good arguments and fair points were made. One such argument was actually a warning that Hollywood missed and is now living out, and that is the very interesting concept of hyperreality and simulacra, ideas coined by Jean Baudrillard. 
Only 50 years after he published the ideas, we can see them playing out in the movies and TV that we see. If you're wondering why movies and TV have been feeling the same for some time, it's due to the hyper-reality in which we live and our writers live. Most of the people that write the shows and movies you watch live in LA, in a bubble, and most are active on social media, especially Twitter, whose algorithm keeps them all clumped together. Apparently they dragged me on Twitter. I don't give a fuck because Twitter's not a real place. The issue we've been seeing for a while is that these writers haven't experienced much reality, only simulations of reality, mostly other movies and shows. This was a big postmodern idea that art, theater, philosophy, etc. could not actually express reality and were merely a simulation of it. Baudrillard noted that as technology progressed, new simulations would be produced that were working off of old simulations. Those of you my age or older may recall when people would describe themselves as one of the characters on Friends. I'm a bit of a Ross myself. I was in my bedroom playing with my dinosaurs. <laughs> and learning. Friends was a simulation of life in New York, and it's been beaten to death now that it was a rather stretched representation. The apartment has been noted to cost an astronomical amount, and no one's salaries in the show, we're gonna cover that. But it was entertaining, and liberties were taken, nothing wrong there. I'll allow it. The issue is that our current generation of writers grew up absorbing these simulacra, and Baudrillard argued that at a certain point, our brains would not be able to tell the difference and would substitute the simulacra for reality. At that point, we would have new simulations that were themselves representations of the previous ones, and so on. That's when the media enters a state of hyper-reality, where we are several steps removed from reality, our actions and media existing as representations of representations of representations. Dream within a dream. Huh. I'm impressed. Worse yet, that hyper-reality bleeds backward into life. Right now you're probably thinking about people who are infected by social media, modeling their lives on fake insta-lives. And that is true, but in Hollywood we're seeing hyper-real prejudices or victimhoods inform new media. That brings us back to Ms. Zegler's Snow White, Ms. Watson's Belle, and other Disney princesses who are being updated because the current state of our simulations are based on simulated ideas about a systemic patriarchy that has been secretly controlling the the world for millennia. These people grew up hearing that the system was out to get them and now everything is based on that representation of reality. Since these actors and writers are chronically online, their reality has become one where the system is always out to get them and they see boogeymen everywhere. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? The patriarchy. <laughs> it shouldn't be surprising then that they seek to rebel against this fabricated reality with these new projects to fix our past cinematic sins. Emma Watson wanted to bring us a more empowered Belle, even though Belle is clearly the hero of the story and is already a symbol of a modern woman thinking for herself, changing minds, and the villain is the classic brutish male wanting to fill her up with children and have her cook his game and clean his house. How exactly was this patriarchal propaganda? It doesn't matter because in the new reality, you always have to be a victim to have power. So old things must be remade, even if they were already sending the message you claim you want. The current Wheel of Time is in the same boat. Showrunner Rafe Judkins wanted to bring a feminist spin to a series whose core message is already gender egalitarian and features a slew of complex and powerful women in many definitions of that word. Sadly, like so many strong female characters, those women have now been flattened to only fit the masculine version of strength, and the show is worse for it. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. So we're seeing a blending of media and social media in this new hyper-reality, leading to everything feeling very similar. Ironically, postmodernists were skeptical of power structures that would gatekeep ideas, yet in current Hollywood only the correct ideas are allowed to be published, all while claiming they're representing the oppressed. It's ironic. Again, Hollywood missed the interesting parts of postmodernism and is now a leftist Ouroboros, only churning out popular ideas based on current year social media opinions. Postmodern disciplines, especially art and now film, are all about challenging preconceived notions and narratives, and they often appear clever the first time or two, and then aren't interesting or saying much. This is because they usually weren't saying much to begin with. 
they were just very different and probably involved a hefty amount of sensationalism. Again, this is not to say that postmodernism is all about spectacle and has no point, though I will say you can find a fair amount of that in it. The point here is that Hollywood took the easiest parts, the mechanics of subversion and satire, and made them the entire point. Turning something upside down and having spectacle is only useful if it leads to another idea. Great, you have the audience's attention with your subversion or whatever. Now, what are you gonna say? What new ideas will we take from this new inverted perspective? There are almost never new ideas. Just the headlines and internet points generated from being unique as though that is the goal in itself. What you want a cookie? You can see the shallow value of these things because they can never be replicated once the novelty wears off, since novelty is the only value they ever had. The Blair Witch Project was a perfect example of this. One of the earliest examples of internet virality, Blair Witch took the nation by storm. They had an excellent marketing campaign and convinced a good majority of the audience that the whole thing was real, and they made all the money, you guys. Various claims put the budget between sixty and two hundred thousand dollars, and the movie would go on globally to make two hundred and fifty million. The shine wore off extremely quickly, however, as audiences realized they had been duped and the movie was straight garbage. That tactic is dead now. There will never be another found footage success like Blair Witch because spectacle with no substance can only work once. I now present an act that no other performer has ever dared to execute. Borat was a big hit in the first movie and people want to pretend that it was culturally significant, but the second swing was a dud that came and went straight to streaming. Great success. This year's Velma is another example of pure subversion. A pizza cutter, all edge, no point. Look, everyone is not white except Fred, who's an idiot with a tiny penis. Daphne deals drugs and her moms are lesbians. There's nudity in a formerly children's product. Ooh, isn't all of this cool? Once again, Mindy Kaling is another Hollywood writer who thinks the act of subversion is the entire point and it's enormously interesting, but forgot to say any anything else. Also, once again, the subversion in question was subverting the hyper-reality of social media, where men are struggling with the burden of being handed even more power. As she put it in the show's opening screed. You gotta be careful, watching too much of that show can cause health problems. So, one day you suddenly notice bleeding from the ear. I keep saying these folks are subverting a fake hyper-reality, and honestly, that's too fancy. We used to just call this a straw man and shun it for the intellectual trash that it is. Hollywood, of course, learned these lessons from the postmodernists themselves, who weren't just making different art, that's what filthy modernists do, they were questioning what the definition of art even was. Easy. Boom. A sad desk. Boom. Sad wall. It's art. Anything is anything. This is where the idea of performance art comes in. One of the worst examples of this stupidity was the seedbed performance piece by Vito Acconci. First performed in 1972, the artist set up a gallery that was empty except for a sloping ramp. He lay under the ramp for hours with a microphone in one hand and his microphone in the other, and he would describe his fantasies about the people above him while playing with himself. That's it. That's the whole performance. The Met describes it as a seminal work, <laughs> I see what they did there, that transformed the physical space of the gallery through minimal intervention to create an intimate connection between artist and audience, even as they remained invisible to one another. Or it was a pervert broadcasting his fantasies to people before internet forums were a thing. Yeah, I've heard it both ways. Once the salacious spectacle is gone, there really isn't anything else of value here. But the postmodernists were trying to redefine art as not something you just do and display, but as an interaction between artist and audience. That can be a cool idea, but sadly the results are mostly dumb masquerading as deep. One recent example of a piece trying to transcend the screen was Jessica Gao's She-Hulk. She thought she was being extraordinarily clever when she made the main villain of the show the internet. the internet! Specifically, it's trolls. Guys, it was so brilliant. She purposely wrote a bad show so people would complain online, but then predicted those complaints in the next week's episode. She was trolling the trolls! Isn't that so cool and smart and interesting? Everybody's so creative! She made the show bad, but then broke the fourth wall and had the character go into the writer's room to call the show bad and interact with the audience. 
Being meta is so smart and original. Another pretty famous postmodernist art performance was called The Couple in the Cage, where Coco Fusco and Guillermo Gomez Pena pretended to be undiscovered Amera Indians and were presented in a cage for onlookers to gawk at. Several of the performances were filmed, and the audience reaction was actually the performance. Whoa! I did not see that common twist ending. Oh, it's so neat and deep. Look, here's a picture of Gomez Pena. He's wearing eyeliner or eyeshadow and looking at you through a speculum. That's probably super deep and, and meaningful, I bet. Postmodernism relies on satire to point out the flaws of modernism. That is why you see so much subversion and attempts at satire and meta comedy. This is why we're seeing so many gender and race swaps in Hollywood right now. They think it's extremely clever, but just, just the swap part. They don't bring us anything of interest as a result of the swap. They just see the act of swapping as interesting in and of itself. Oh look, Galadriel's now a badass tough fighter, full of piss and vinegar with a sword that's broken from killing so many orcs. Okay, cool, you've subverted the previous narrative about the wise queen Galadriel from the Lord of the Rings movies, now what will you do with it? It turned out they did nothing with it. It was just so neat that she was different. That's all that mattered. You are not serious people. Disney thought recasting Ariel with Halle Bailey was incredibly neat. Even Bailey herself said this new Little Mermaid was a different take. In the end, we got a boring, drab movie that is an hour longer than the original with nothing to show for it. But we got representation! We did a thing! We subverted the old! We had the spectacle of racial casting! But what did we do with that new perspective? Nothing. Because the subversion of the old is so interesting, why go further? After it was time to retire Steve Rogers, Marvel thought they were being intensely clever by promoting Sam Wilson to Blackton America. Did this new version bring a new perspective? Did we learn anything about black culture? No, oh, no. My daddy told me it's Black Falcon. Nope. We had the spectacle of race casting and little more. We rehashed the tired hyper-reality that black people only have one defining quality, and that is the struggle. None of our characters learned anything of value. There is no point to this show other than subversion, spectacle, and signaling the writer's amazing virtues. Oh, everybody look at me. I'm the greatest. It's plain to see. The folks in Hollywood think they are being edgy and rebelling against the previous ideas and narratives, but everything coming from LA is just empty exhibition. A huge irony in the current iteration of postmodernism is that it affirms the validity and importance of the things it rebels against. Postmodernism can be an interesting thing to study if you want to learn how to ask questions from different perspectives and question established ideas. The glaring issue is that postmodernism has no ideas of its own. It's, it's basically this. Uh, everything that guy just says bullshit. Thank you. What's even worse is that without the context of the ideas that it's rebelling against, postmodernism has no meaning whatsoever. In some senses, it can be quite interesting to spin something differently. In most cases, it's lazy. The fearless girl statue being placed in front of the Wall Street Bull in 2017 is a great example. The statue is nice, but it only gains meaning when in front of the bull. Apart from its placement and it being set up the day before International Women's Day, the statue has no meaning. If you saw it in a different place or time, you'd probably assume it was a memorial to a dead girl who likely bravely fought cancer but lost or something. So it's the bull that actually has meaning. Anything that is purely in reaction to it inherently has less meaning unless it somehow actively adds it, which the fearless girl did not. Hilariously, women were conned, as this was not a tribute to brave women everywhere, it was a marketing tactic to sell a new index fund, which, granted, was a fund investing in gender-diverse companies, but a stock fund, all the same. The fearless girl facing down the Wall Street bull was paid for by a Wall Street firm. We have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray, run amok, and flat out deceived. This is the same with Hollywood's obsession with straight white men and rich people. Everything is in reaction to them. Everything in Hollywood only makes sense in the context of a world of straight white men. So we can draw a partial conclusion that straight white men are the important ones, not the responses. We are currently swimming in an ocean of strong female characters because Hollywood wants to challenge the narratives of females being feminine. 
How do they make a female character strong? Make her as masculine as possible, obviously. See, they aren't adding depth to femininity or bringing an interesting view of gender dynamics. They just don't like the old world view and want to challenge it. Challenge the notion that men have to be the ones in charge and saving everyone. Except the way they have gone about that is by writing shows and movies where men are in charge and saving everyone, but they just cast a woman to read the lines. In their rebellion against toxic masculinity, they only affirmed it and made it the central talking point. I am inevitable. The same goes for race swaps. Why is it so great that Captain America and Ariel are black now? Because they were white before? Framing the argument in this way, which Hollywood constantly does, only tells us that the white roles and positions are the desirable ones by trying to rebel against this imaginary idea that white people are in charge of everything hollywood is only affirming their position of importance and tying it to their race finding a role that is popular and has been held by a white person and then casting a different race says nothing about that other race it only says something about the white character. Hollywood puts rich white men on a pedestal and then tries to compete with them. This just makes rich white men the gold standard and assigns importance to them. Then they heap more importance on them by making their new and rebelling characters just like them. It's good to be the king. So much of Hollywood is parody or subversion because they don't know how to make original ideas, only react to and tear down previous ones. They also don't know how to portray real life and emotions, only reference other people's portrayals. If we actually wanted to put forward ideas about the value of women, black people, and other races, we would tell original stories about their lives and show their strengths, but we don't see that. We only see the strength of white men and compare everything to that. Look at me now. Oh, look at me now. Yeah. The trans movement is definitely postmodern. It seeks to break down the grand narrative and objective truth of binary sex. Everything is relative, a gradient. We can never know what is what, blah, 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 blah. Everything about trans and gender stuff is based in our traditional understanding of gender roles. The ideas of masculinity and femininity encompass most of human behavior, so there isn't a third option. The idea of non-binary doesn't exist, and it is only defined by what it is not, yet has no idea of what it is. For the trans, how does one know if they are a woman instead of a man? Well, they do female things. What are female things if female is just a social construct? It's a self-defeating argument, and it only affirms that there are two genders, and general traits can be applied to both. Again, the spectacle of, I'm not like the other genders, is the novelty driving this whole movement. It has no ideas. It puts forward nothing interesting. Even the idea that we as people can mix masculine and feminine is not new or interesting, and the trans and non-binary movements can't claim they introduced those concepts. The only one that honestly says something interesting are the asexuals. It's true that they are contrasting themselves to everyone else who is sexual, but it's the only idea in the gender debates that has anything interesting to say. How much of our lives are driven by sex and romance, and what would life look like apart from those things? In a way, it's a bit of a modernist idea. Is sex superfluous? And if we stripped it away, would we make more progress? That would make for some interesting discussion. So we've seen that postmodernism was about challenging larger narratives, especially the modernist notion that there is a knowable progress and perfection for humans to work toward. The problem is that in only about two decades, things went from, we can't know the ultimate goal of humanity, so there's no way to work towards it, to there is no ultimate goal at all. No such thing as truth or objective reality. That's when things got stupid, and Hollywood has been retelling this stupidity for the last decade or so. We have now been infected with nihilism, absurdism, and moral relativity. Anything can be anything. Mike, please set them straight. This is this. This ain't something else. This is this. The 70s saw a rise of French postmodernism that became drunk on its influence and cool new anti-ideas, and at one point supported relations with children. 
Yes, multiple leaders of postmodern thought signed multiple petitions to lower the age of consent. These are the big names you're going to hear when talking about this philosophy. Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean-Francois Lyotard. <laughs> His name's Lyotard. And this recognizable guy, Foucault, whose first name, ah, oh God, I can't, White, what's his first name? Michel. Ah, right. Now, I want so badly to believe that this was a kind of satire similar to Jonathan Swift advocating for eating babies, but this particular subject is always a bad call. When arguing about the rights of children, they could have tried for anything. Why sex? It's always a sketchy look. And I understand how a logical thought process can go too far. I am a literal card-carrying libertarian, and I am strongly in favor of gun rights. Logically, there isn't really anything separating a fully and semi-automatic weapon from, say, hand grenades and rocket launchers. So I could be arguing that all citizens should have the right to own whatever kind of weapon they want, especially if the government also owns them, but deep down, I know that's silly, so I don't make those arguments. Again, if the postmodernists were trying to make some point about the legal age for other activities, there were so many other ways to illustrate that other than kids. When we libertarians are being goofy and trying to make a point about government overreach, we're calling seatbelt laws tyranny. We don't involve children. It's troubling that this generation of postmodernists signed those petitions. Of course, Hollywood took the worst possible interpretation of this idea again, and we have things like cuties on Netflix. How did this show get past the pitch meeting? How? The implications are dark, but it's just one area where we're seeing the decay of morality, not because Hollywood is suddenly immoral. That's been the story of humanity ever since Cain killed his brother. No, the real issue is that Hollywood looked at postmodernism and decided there are no morals. There is no objective truth. Everything is subjective and relative, and that includes ideas like truth and virtue. I know we live in a world where anything can mean anything, and nobody even cares about animals. And this leads to to the cool new interesting idea that villains aren't really villains. What if villainy were all about perspective? <gasps> what if there was no such thing as villains at all? We've seen the results with evil villains that get a flashback toward the end of the production and we discover that they were bullied once and that means they aren't actually villains but victims. Subversion is so cool! Everybody's so creative! I have seen idiotic amounts of praise for Killmonger, the villain of MCU's Black Panther. He grew up poor and he he makes allusions to slavery, so, you know, he's got good points, guys. No, he is a xenophobic megalomaniac with a body count higher than the average guest on that stupid whatever podcast, and nothing changes that. There is nothing deep about this character or that movie, honestly. Like, I don't hate it. Black Panther is above average for the MCU. That's the best I can say. Got a killer soundtrack, fun fights, and an imaginative world, but the critics filleting this film is mind-boggling. See, there you have it. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta open your throat, relax your jaw. Don't forget to cup the balls. <clears throat> I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again. Kung Fu Panda is a freaking masterpiece and has an example of a real complex villain, Tai Lung. The movie does not attempt to persuade us that morals don't exist and Tai Lung's actions are in any way justified, but it does give us enough backstory to make his motives understandable and interesting. There is a difference between an understandable villain and a shallowly redeemed one. Hack writers, influenced partly by postmodernism, think showing one or two bad things happening to a villain suddenly means they aren't really the bad guy. Or they show the hero littering or jaywalking or something and then they try to make some moral equivalency between them and the villain. You know, it's funny, this is exactly what writers used to do to show us how screwed up a villain's thought process is. They would try to justify their villainy by finding any flaw in the hero, no matter how minor, and they would say, We're not so different, you and me. We're not. So different, you and I. You and I, we're really not so very different. Methods are not different as much as you pretend. You and me, we're not so different. You and I are not so different. Are we so different, you and I? Suddenly, you've got writers portraying their villains this way, unironically, thinking that it's smart. When they're not trying to make us sympathize with the villain, some writers are trying the villainless approach. This is coming from what I think is one of the worst offshoots of postmodernism, nihilism. Nothing matters. There is no grand order. No real morals. Everything's just an accident. From this worldview, it would make sense to write a story that doesn't have a protagonist or antagonist. Why should there be such things? Who's to say what is good or bad? So these stories just kind of float along without anything to drive the action because a conflict requires some kind of antagonist. 
One of the more famous examples of this is Encanto, a garbage movie wrapped in a soundtrack so damned amazing you don't care if the story is any good. We don't talk about Bruno. Hey, one of those was your favorite, now it's in your head, and honestly, you're welcome. There are far worse earworms in the world. But if you remove the absolute bangers, you don't have much else. The villain in the story is vaguely Abuela, maybe? Really, the antagonist is just familial expectation or, or something. It's very weak. But it's a result of writing teams who think this idea is interesting. It's not. And even if it were, it makes for a terrible story! Some things don't translate to screen, like Discworld, and the antagonist list story is one of them. But if we zoom out even further, the idea of no villains is a symptom of a larger problem ushered in by postmodernism, that truth only lies in the eyes of the beholder. Everything is subjective at its core, and our perspective and perception of it changes it, sometimes literally. According to some, Sartre had this idea about the look, that we as conscious beings are actively changed when observed by another, and vice versa. Using this logic, a theater performance is different every night when different people observe it. A big trend in postmodern art and theater was to intentionally leave the meaning of a piece vague or leave it out entirely. In this way, all interpretations are valid. There's no way to know objective truth after all, and we can't even be sure other people are seeing the world the same way we do. Hell, according to this angry looking fella, Immanuel Kant, there is a whole reality that none of us can actually grasp, and each person could theoretically be experiencing the real reality differently. So who's to say that your interpretation of a piece is not valid? To add to that validity, artists and performers began to include the audience in their pieces. This participation changed the art, they thought, making it transcend its original meaning, if it ever had one. Once again, this can be a cool idea but has since devolved into meaninglessness. Lazy artists and writers put the effort of interpreting their work onto the audience so they don't actually have to be creative or bring good ideas. I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! You keep digging! It also makes for an excellent cover when they themselves aren't sure what they want to say. The Barbie movie was a perfect example of this. It wanted to say about five different things, some of them conflicting, and as a result, it didn't stick the landing on any of its points. The convenient thing about the postmodern attitude is that Greta Gerwig can simply say all the points were valid for different parts of the audience depending on their perspective. Its defenders say that it's a complex and deep film. It isn't. It was just mismanaged. If you're looking for a movie with multiple messages that actually is deep, go watch Across the Spider-Verse and pay attention to Spider-Punk, Hobie. Here is a character that is purposefully complex, seeming to be smart and dumb at the same time. Is he standing up for the anti-establishment values, or is he a subtle mockery of people who do? You could argue both, making him an interesting character to discuss. Talk amongst yourselves! <laughs> discuss! Postmodernism and its current derivatives can sometimes appear clever on the surface, but the majority of it is basic skepticism, seeking only to poke some holes in things and look smart. It is true that there is no way to empirically prove the existence or truth of meta narratives. It is true that there is no representation of reality that actually shows it for what it is. However, once you're done impressing the average high school student with these revelations, you still haven't said anything of substance. Can be easily observed that Hollywood has a leftist bent. That's not exactly mind-blowing news. Once again, however, it fits nicely with their adoption of postmodern ideas and Marxism. It's very important to note that postmodernism and Marxism are not the same thing, and they differ greatly in a couple of areas, yet they tend to make really good friends. There tend to be common worldview pairings like this. I'm a big proponent of Stoic philosophy. Shockingly, I'm also a Christian. Aside from these Stoic leanings toward polytheism, it tends to get along very well with Christianity. In the same way, postmoderns and Marxists make easy allies. It's not surprising that most of Hollywood is left-leaning or openly communist socialists, and the major voices in postmodernism are all on the left, many being in the communist party of their respective countries. One of postmodernism's critiques of modernism is that finding the ultimate goal seemed to favor the powerful, or the majority, whoever was in charge. Naturally, unconscious biases and the system favoring one group over others would lead to more of that group discovering what the best of things really was, and that is a valid critique.
critique. For just one example, eugenics can be rightly described as a modernist idea, but in a crazy coincidence, the desirable genes were those of the existing majority. Interesting. Remember, postmodernism was skeptical or outright antagonistic toward power structures and gatekeepers because they ultimately decided what got made, what became mainstream. Their complaint was that the mainstream was often taken as truth and minority ideas were suppressed. You can see how this makes a good companion to Marx's ideas about class struggle and the dangers of the bourgeoisie. Any of this sound familiar with regard to identity politics and representation? There is a mountain of criticism for Hollywood being woke, but that term can be tricky to pin down. I prefer to call it performative diversity as it really is just a show that gives them a feeling of morality. So much of performative diversity is about pushing forward women or people of color, which is okay to say even though colored people isn't, but whatever. We're seeing a whole slew of projects retconning history to insert races or women where there weren't any. The idea here is that white men have run everything for forever, and so the world is shaped by their preferences, their truths, which are subjective. As stated in a previous section, this hilariously cements white men's place in history as inevitable and all-powerful since Hollywood wants to imagine themselves in the white men's place throughout history instead of imagining a completely different history or future. Often you see these alternate versions of history with women being the ones in charge and men scraping and bowing, which means they don't see an egalitarian world. They think someone must always be in the power position and they're just mad it's not them. By fixing the sins of the past, I guess they think they'll usher in new ideas that would have been present if systemic racism and sexism hadn't been around to stifle humanity for so long. But again, they keep presenting the same ideas of the past, just washed in the color du jour. Black Cleopatra, Black Achilles, Indian Velma, female Marvel hero, pick one. None of this is really different, it's just a different color. But of course, it's not just the white men who hold the reins of power, it's really the rich people and the capitalists. We the boys! If capitalism didn't impose its evil meritocracy, there wouldn't be a profit motive to support some ideas and suppress others. I don't know what Carl sounded that probably wasn't it though. For this reason, the rich guy is always the bad guy in movies and shows. He, for it's almost always a he, is uncaring about the people around him. He usually doesn't know how to operate simple everyday items like a coffee maker. He's out of touch and won't give anyone a chance. He pulled the ladder up behind him as the fantasy goes. If a poor person is the villain, his motives are explained sympathetically as the direct result of a rich person being terrible in some way. For modern Hollywood and postmodernists like Foucault, everything is about power, and in Hollywood, they want it. This video by The Despot of Antrim is about the Barbie movie, or more specifically, its constant theme of power. For both the postmodernist and the Marxist, only power exists. It's all that matters. They're obsessed with power and getting it. And since they have decided that rich white men have all of it, they must be defeated if the power is to be seized. These are the roots of performative diversity, or wokeness, and they are taken from the great postmodern thinkers. This is why every clever writer wants to subvert things, especially the dreaded rich white man. Postmodernism brought some interesting ideas, certainly, and I recommend that you investigate it. Even if you don't agree with most of it, as I don't, it's still instructive as a different way to think about things. Sadly, Hollywood didn't feel like thinking too hard and took the easy way out, and the current state of the movie and TV industry is what we get. If you've made it this far, I look forward to reading your philosophical thoughts on the movie industry in the comment section. I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.